In collaboration with WTJX, the League of Women Voters of the Virgin Islands is pleased to present one-on-one -on -one interviews with candidates for the seventh legislative seat in the Virgin Islands from St. Thomas St. John District. All candidates were contacted and invited to participate. Four either declined or did not respond to our invitation. I am Rosalie Simmons Ballantyne of the League of Women Voters. Today we are pleased to have Janelle Soro for an interview. Welcome, Ms. Soro, and please introduce yourself to our voters. Thank you for having me here, Ms. Ballantyne, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for allowing us, um, the candidates, to engage in a robust discussion on the issues affecting the territory. I'm Janelle K. Soro, and I am a young millennial um, I returned home with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science, a Master of, Ar of Arts degree in Organizational Leadership, and a certificate in um, Servant Leadership. I began teaching U.S. History at Charlotte Amalia High School. I'm a part-time professor of um, Political Science at the University of the Virgin Islands. I am currently the Chief Researcher and Special Assistant to the Lieutenant Governor. Um, my passion is deep, my intentions are pure, and I'm ready, able, and willing to serve. Well. Welcome and thank you, Ms. Saru. So let's begin with our questions. There's only one seat that the voters will be selecting someone for, and there are 13 aspirants. Mm -hmm. What are your unique characteristics that would encourage voters to se select you over the remaining 12? Um, first of all, I mean, it's evident that the special election occurred only because of the challenge presented by the team and myself. Um, we had the courage to act, the only team with the courage to act, the courage to actually, you know, challenge the status quo and ask a question. And because of, you know, months of litigation, the courts ruled, the governor called a special election, and we are here today. So the, the, the mere fact that I was willing to stand up for what I felt was wrong um, stand by my righteous indignations would be key because we're here because one candidate, one team had the courage to act. Well, it's interesting because you've gotten both criticism and praise have, for your actions. I have, I have. So what should the public take away from all that has happened based on what, what you've done? What should they take um, away about you? I that I'm willing to, even if I don't really go with, um, Dr. King always talks about there comes a time when you take a position that's not, you know, politic or popular expedient, but because conscious as it's right. And I, I let my moral conscience guide me. Um, the fact that I'm willing to stand alone for something that I believe in. And in the art of doing good never comes with praise. If you look at every world leader, um, they've been crucified, they've been chastised, and then decades later we realize the the benefits of the action. So the mere fact that I'm willing to stand independently and, and say, hey, this is what we should be doing, this is wrong, challenge what is existing, the, the existing status quo, that's the takeaway from it, whether or not you agree or disagree. Um, but I'm open to dialogue, I'm open to a, a, a conversation, and I, I realize that you know many of us are afraid of change, and that's the biggest thing that we faced here in the territory. Okay, very good. So, what do you think, now that you're running in this, prim this mm -hmm. election, what are the three primary issues facing the territory? The economy is one. Without mm -hmm. money, there's not much that you can do. So I'll say the economy, um, the environment, mm -hmm. and probably crime. And let's take the question of crime. Mm -hmm. What would you so what would be your suggestions and how we would address that issue? We have to connect the dots. Well, crime starts from a moral standpoint and a political standpoint, policy. Um, morally, we have to, we need a revolution of values and it starts in the home. Government cannot go to PTA meetings, government cannot pick up report cards. So we have citizens that must actually partake, do what they're supposed to do, parent, educate, police. Um, from a policy standpoint, what we can do would be to expand our video policing program, more cameras in our downtown areas and our crime middle areas. We need to provide more 
intervention and prevention program for our young men and women, we should look at the curriculum in um, YRC because YRC has not been, they fall in short of rehabilitating. For some of our viewers who might not know, what is YRC? Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Our Youth Rehabilitation Center in okay. St. Croix. Okay. And we have, not, we have not packed those areas with the proper counselor, psychologist, teachers to turn our kids around. So they leave from YRC and go into Golden Grove Prison. Um, we could look at the education. You know, there's not every child that wants to go on an academic course. What are mm -hmm. our alternatives to get them there? So we're looking at, at expanding our marine industry program, VOCED, where we, you know, kids graduate with um, certificates in cosmetology mm -hmm. and masonry. Our, our students can start from eighth grade scuba diving, ninth grade, they get their C, nine to 11, get their C time in, 12th grade, they take a captain's test and they come with a captain's license. So create more avenues for them, more opportunities for them, um, more funding most likely to human services because mm -hmm. of the disconnect right now between human services, education, the VIPD, they're all functioning in silos mm -hmm. and we all service the same group of, of troubled children. So these are some of the things that we can do, but crime must be, there must be an approach from a, 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 a a, a multilateral front. We can't always be like, okay, crime, and, and, and continue to increase the amount of laws that we have because we have some of the toughest policies on the books. We have some tough gun laws, mm -hmm. you know, and then our enforcement. We need to, uh, we need to fix our enforcement deficiency. Mm -hmm. our now, some of the things that you talked about mm -hmm. require money. Of course they do. <laughs> <laughs> we already talked about the yeah. economy. Yeah, we have. So, um, what is what is your feeling about the proposed um, tax package that the governor's presented? Um, the so-called sin taxes. <laughs> um, are you in favor or against? Yes or no? Um, I'm not in favor of taxing any new existing industry. We can't continue to shift the burden um, for quite some time. Government employees carry the burden. We had government employees take an 8% cut, increase their GRS um, deductions, insurance was increased. Now we shifted the burden from that to the private sector. Mm -hmm. And we cannot continue to, ex um, to tax existing industries but tax new revenue streams. And we haven't done a good job of going outside of the box and creating new revenue streams. So I'm not in favor of the proposed package or the amended package mm -hmm. by the Senate. Well, what are some of the new revenue streams that you would pursue? What would be some of your thoughts about how we could increase revenues? Um, one could be tax and monetary exports. We call them monetary remittances, would be uh, money transfer agencies. A lot of money leaves this territory and it goes back to different countries and it it's already money that's not taxed. So let's catch it before it leaves our shores, mm -hmm. um, maybe 2%, 1%. Increase, or we can just expand our EDA program to the online betting agencies and the um, processing companies' credit cards. Um, you tax that's at 300, and I think at, right last time I checked, it was 310 billion dollars that industry was worth. You lure some of those companies here in our EDA program. You tax them at a rate of maybe three percent. You leave close to a few billion dollars in the territory. Um, we have 100 and last time, maybe like a month ago, it was 141 million outstanding taxes that were not collected. You know, we have to enforce what's on the books. Before we go and tax existing agencies, these are the things that we can do. Our taxis, you know, we all know that it's a cash industry. Um, they're not taxed what they should be taxed. We can begin by having taxis pay road tax, mm -hmm. and that goes to our roads. There are a lot of different ways that we can, you know, and you, when you go to the bond market, you go to the bond market for capital projects that would ensure return of investment. You don't always go to the bond market to say, let's pay government bills, let's meet payroll. Mm -hmm. So I would propose going to the bond market for a project that we know would have a for sure return of investment. In mm -hmm. Bavoni, we have about 20 acres of land. There can be another transshipment port in Bavoni that would employ our young men we have um, a lot of ships that come in, and that's, that's a whole, that's a separate industry that, you know, we can ensure that as a percentage of our young people, or our, not even young people, just people in general, are employed by such a project. 
But in the short term, mm -hmm. what do you see in the short term? Because the monetary exports, okay. tax and monetary exports, would be okay. a short term, and and collecting road tax from um, taxis and collecting the outstanding millions in property mm -hmm. taxes. That would be short term. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you and the others, and certainly the person who was is successful in this special mm -hmm. election, is going to be somewhat of a footnote in history, because as I understand it, this is the first, first time yes. that we're having one of these special elections. So what are your thoughts about the process, and what, if anything, would you change about the process? This process, the law is ambiguous, the code. The code should be revised. And the mere fact that we don't even have a constitution, a working constitution, we have a precarious um, legal document that was drafted by Congress in 1954 and later amended in 1966. Um, what we need to do is actually call for an, another convention and that would allow us to. <laughs> yeah, been, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Laugh. It's been contentious because we've chosen to define a Virgin Islander and you know it, it infringes upon the rights of others. But what, we, what this calls for is a constitution in order for us to achieve any level of political maturity. So that, that is what I would propose. The mere fact that we have these ambiguous laws, um, there's a lot of loopholes, and when, when folks see the loopholes, you take advantage of the loopholes. And a constitution, as you know from being an attorney, is like the vehicle that drives any democracy. Mm -hmm. you know? So that would be what I would definitely change. Or, a champion. Well, certainly, yeah. um, and that's something that we've been talking about for a long time, and certainly that would address a lot of the issues that yes. we have. Yes. But in so far, and hopefully we won't come to this situation again. <laughs> uh -huh. But um, I'm sure as you've prepared for this, there have been questions or certain things that you've said. I think this. I think this needs to be better. I think this needs to be changed through the electoral process. What will be some of those The vetting process of our candidates. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think it's high time at the board. In any, in any agency that you go to, there is clearly employment guidelines, the qualifications needed, how they go about vetting in an HR department. What we need is the Board of Elections to come out and say, you know, we're, we're a bit lackluster. We kind of dropped the ball on this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is our plan of action in the next four or five years. I actually, if, if elected, would, you know, mm -hmm. ask the board to begin, like, you know, the, the PDs on a consent degree, um, labor, you know, has been targeted by the federal government. So there's no reason why the Board of Elections cannot be held to the fire and say, look, this is how you've been operating lately, and it cannot happen because almost every year we are guaranteed to have an election fiasco, whether it's the machines, whether it's the, the fact that the board can't meet, whether it's that they can't find a quorum. There's always something happening, and the Board of Elections is an integral part. They're the first mm -hmm. line of defense in a democracy, like the fire marshals. That's, mm -hmm. that's their job. So I, I, I believe that I'll, I'll call for some transparency mm -hmm. in how we accept candidates, how we look at candidates. Okay. Let's go back to the um, critical issues. Mm -hmm that you feel like confronting the territory. And I think one of the ones that you said was the environment. Expand on that for me a little. We have two little trash sites. I actually took a walk down Main Street and I was more than halfway down Main Street before I ran into the first trash bin. Um, so people, I and mean, it's a cultural issue too. We, we litter for no reason, but then there's a lack of trash bins and sites so, you know, the average tourist that leaves some haven site that walks the entire waterfront and makes it to the parking lot area, there's still not a trash bin in sight. And that trash turns into, um, it actually goes into our marine um, mm -hmm. life. And then we damage our coral reefs and our reefs. People come here to snorkel. And then you damage the tourism product in the process. We have um, construction taking place on, on the coastal areas. There's not enough water catchments, and the runoff is coming, and it's damaging our, again, our reefs, our sea life. And then when the sea life is damaged, and the fishermen fish, and then you eat that fish, you're poisoned. Mm -hmm. So that's just, um, and then I would actually would call for a ban on um, plastics, single-use plastics, call for a ban on the use of straws, because, um, you know, 
I mean, coffer ban and styrofoam. Styrofoam takes 2,000 mm -hmm. years to decompose, and our trash site is, you know, so high that we we are not um, disposing of trash correctly as well. Okay, so you've got a lot of ideas about how, what to, well, to yeah. do about that. So we thank you, <laughs> thank you, Miss uh, Miss Cyril, for sharing your thoughts okay. with our voters, and thank you, WTJX, for this time. The League of Women Voters of the Virgin Islands encourages all eligible voters to vote on April 8th. Those who come out to vote and convince others to do the same help determine who our leaders will be. We have major issues in the Virgin Islands that require capable and informed leadership. Your vote can determine who will fill the vacant seat in our legislature. So see you at the polls on April 8th. Thank you.